We are now live. So, Woo! guys, everyone, thanks for joining us. Apologies for a little bit of a late start. Um, we we had some some friends joining from uh, Texas. Um, we uh, <laughs> we wanted to give you a little bit of an insight as to what we're going to cover today, and uh, just, I'm going to walk through a little bit of the structure for today, um, and then we're going to have introductions and then get into it. So. The idea behind this panel actually was um, Ricardo's. He he uh, noticed that, you know, and, and I noticed it as well. I'm sure the rest of the people noticed that there was a lot of inbound questions from founders, not only in our portfolios, but also, you know, on Twitter and in other social channels around what, how to best fundraise during these times. And Rick rang me up and said, hey, you know what would be great is if we if we could perhaps help answer some of those questions. So thanks, Rick, for um, for, for bringing us together here. Um, and so we, we kind of sat down and said, all right, well, what are the things that are most likely going to be worth discussing to address this, this problem comprehensively? And so the, the layout of today's session is going to be around um, all the first half is going to be mostly around the fundraising elements. And those elements include the metrics and product that will be different today versus, let's say, a year ago, the round sizes, the valuations that founders can expect the terms that founders can expect, the communications, um, what does it look like to, to get in touch with uh, VCs during this time? And then we're gonna break out from fundraising specifically and go into what sectors are affected by this, uh, these times, and what sectors are hot, which sectors are less interesting, and why, when they might recover. And I don't, I suspect we didn't really, you know, discuss this beforehand, the, the panelists. So. There might be some disagreement, which is exactly what I'm hoping for, because then it'll be providing you guys insights into how different investors can look at different sectors in different ways. We'll then talk a little bit about recommendations on cash management and finalize with any insights from any anybody who's uh, wants to dig up war stories from 1999 or 2008 and how companies survived this time. So that's the, the general layout for, for this hour. Um, I want to first of all thank all of you guys, Ophelia, Ricardo, Scott, Robert, um, on this, it's uh, super great to have you guys here. And maybe we can just kick off with introductions, your name, your fund sector that you, you focus in, and uh, the stage that you invest in. Maybe kick it off with you, Rick. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Carlos. So hi, everyone. I'm Ricardo. I'm a partner in uh, the Target Global Early Stage Fund. We invest in seed and Series A stage companies uh, across Europe, pretty uh, sector agnostic. And... Um, yeah, that's actually my my second virtual panel, uh, be, which I have to say I love because you can drink uh, beer out of a coffee cup without anyone uh, realizing. So um, just joking, obviously. Um, yeah, that's it. Nice. Ophelia. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a founding partner at Blossom. Uh, we are an early stage VC with three partners based in Europe. Um, we cover the entirety of Europe, um, but looking for... Uh, very ambitious founders who want to sell beyond that. Um, so thinking about building global businesses. We invest mainly at Series A. We do the very occasional seed. Um, and we bring what we call a high conviction investment approach to Europe, which means we only make about five investments a year. So when we come in, we really come in uh, with conviction, with the full partnership, um, and bring a combination of operational investment experience to the table. Scott? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Scott. I'm one of the founders of Crane Venture Partners. We're an early stage fund focused purely on enterprise uh, companies, only in Europe. And so we're typically writing checks between 500K and, and 3 million. And our mission really is focused on empowering the enterprise cust uh, users. So the, the, the founders we're backing are, are building products, typically selling into large enterprise, and we want to have an impact on the end users who use those products. Rob? Very good. And then I'm Rob. I'm one of the partners at Borderson Capital. Uh, I guess we are the token old VC in the panel today. Um, so we've been around 20 years um, focused on Europe. So focus on European tech companies uh, that are getting going. Um, Series A focus. Um, and we could do yeah a check size of up to 15 million. So into some Series Bs as well. Um, we invest anywhere across Europe. We invest in tech very broadly. I personally do a lot of fintech and insurance, so that those are sectors I can talk about in most depth. I also do a bit of games investing um, for fun on the side. Um, 
yeah, that's it. Thanks, Rob. And um, I guess we're the second oldest by definition then, since uh, Seed Camp has been around for 12 years. Uh, obviously, I'm your host and moderator, Carlos Espinal, uh, managing partner along with Reshma of Seed Camp. We invest, as the name implies, in seed stage and pre-seed stage, and we look at all sectors. So with that, I want to pass it on to you, Rick. Um, yeah. I know that you compiled some interesting information about uh, fundraising and, and some of the um, the growth rates of companies before COVID and now, and then maybe we can kick off the chat with that context. Yep. No, thanks, Carlos. So yeah, I mean, there've been lots of questions around, you know, how active are VCs during this time and what's what's happening to valuations. And I, I, I saw an interesting stat the other day uh, that, that talked about kind of activity levels uh, in the first three months since lockdown in the UK. And you saw that UK startups raised around 660 uh, million pounds, which is, you know, roughly 30% higher year on year and, and on first glance shows some kind of activity. But then if you if you look a bit uh, more into those numbers, you see that uh, actual number of new deals were down 40%. So in reality, um, you know, there's probably more, more of a trend towards kind of existing investors putting money into uh, into companies to, to ensure the survival and not necessarily kind of invest the confidence. Um, and then on the other uh, on the other question around valuations, I think what you know on the first glance what you see is that you you know you really have to distinguish I think between kind of later stage and earlier stage. Uh, there were some kind of prominent down rounds on on kind of more growth stage companies. I think Monzo was a was was one that kind of hit the news that you know raised at around forty percent low valuation. Uh, and on the other, I think an early stage, uh, as I can tell, I mean it's. It seems to be more driven by competitive dynamics than than kind of say public valuations. Uh, so you know the, the stock market level is not necessarily having an impact on you know the seed stage uh, valuations. Um, so yeah, uh, it would be great to 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 see what you know what what other people think and if this mirrors a little bit. Uh, uh, so Rick, what we'll do is, I mean, you, you brought up a lot of good points here and we're going to unpack those points over the course of the next sections and particularly the valuation ones, because I think there's a lot of complexity in, in that, you know, the difference, especially for founders listening, the difference between, let's say, what determines a valuation and how competitive dynamics can influence that valuation, which decouples it from, let's say, a market driven um, approach and why investors are getting into these competitive scenarios at the moment versus maybe less so before, but maybe more so now. And I think I just want to add to the context that if you look in the public stock markets, you're seeing this huge flight to quality. And I think the same thing is happening in venture in a, in a smaller way where um, investors are looking to put money, but they're looking to put money where they feel they're probably willing to take less bets. Um, but let's let's take a step back and then first cover metrics and product, because I think if, if we go through this systematically, one of the things that as a founder might be asking myself is, OK, fine, I get it. Times are tough. Things are hard, but I still need to, to, to impress you somehow. Right. I still need to showcase some level of traction to really kind of stand out from other companies. And I understand that things are changing. And the reason why I, I, I wanted to touch upon this first is because in the public markets, there's companies that are now doing adjustments to EBITDA to compensate for for COVID. And I wanted to get your thoughts. Maybe, Rob, we can we can start off with you is how are you looking at companies uh, reflecting their their metrics and their KPIs to deal with what's going on at the moment so that they can still come across like they're doing well, but in light of the circumstances? Yeah, yeah. it's a really it's, it's a tough one to answer, honestly. Um, yeah, we're investing Series A. The metrics are still very early at Series A. Um, and I think this sort of old approach you took ARR are multiplied by 10, and that gives you roughly the valuation. That was always stretched and now seems to be completely forgotten. If it's a really exciting company, then investors are willing to pay 50 times ARR. Uh, and if it's not exciting, they're not interested to invest at all and you can't raise at any price. Um, and so I think what you see at Series A is very much the function of how much the com money the company needs and, and then the level of competitive interest in the company. And then when we're looking at the metrics, I think we look at sort of B2B versus B2C. B2B, we see Q2 as being a pretty dead quarter uh, in terms of growth, and we're not expecting much growth. Um, equally, we're not expecting much churn, uh, and then we hope that things will recover over the course of Q3, Q4. Um, B2C is all over the place. Um, so some B2C is down 80%, and that's fine, because that's what the sector's doing. Uh, and some B2C is up 300%. And I think what's tough for us is 
Yeah, they're looking at a company right now which should be a big beneficiary of coronavirus and it's up 100%. Is that good? Normally that would be extraordinarily good, but should it be up 300% right now because other companies with a similar idea are up 300%. So it's, yeah, it's very hard to find a right benchmark at the moment. I think it's also important anyway, not to focus... Here. Sorry, start again, sorry. I think, Ophelia, your audio cut out? I think I might just be playing around with the mute button. Is oh, okay, that... yeah. you're good to go. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's important also not just to focus on the short-term impact of coronavirus and figure out, you know, is 300% this month good or is it bad or being down 90%? Is that good or bad? But uh, focusing on the longer term as well. Um, mm. And so definitely when we have looked at companies fundraising in the last three months, We've tried to kind of strip out the coronavirus effects as much as possible um, to see, you know, what was happening before the impact or what is likely to happen when we all go back to some sense of normalcy. Um, and I think it's actually that's where we pay greater attention rather than how the company has fared in the last three months. Yeah, because maybe. even if the company's up like 600 percent, you know, when we all go back to work or, you know, if there is a normal that bears anything that we were used to before, then that growth is going to disappear again. Um, so I think we're trying to think much longer yeah. term as well. Um, can, I, can I just add one one other point to this that, that I mean, we really kind of uh, started including in our decision making process was also, you know, less metrics focused, but also, you know, how do the CEOs behave or how's management behaved over the last two, three months? You know, how quickly have they adapted to the new reality in terms of changing the product or changing the organization and kind of really more kind of looking at the strength of the management in a crisis um, has, has increasingly been important and a good opportunity for, for CEOs to really shine in, in, a, in a difficult time. Scott, I know that you've, you've dealt with a lot of, I mean, your, your fund basically focuses on a lot of companies that are probably affected on the sales cycles. And I mean, what, what at the board level, what are you guys recommending? Uh, if 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 they're needing to go out and fundraise, um, we're still, I think, in this, I, I call it the messy middle. You know, for us doing seed deals, it's like nothing's happened in the market. If you have a great team, a great product, as Ophelia said, we're not focused on what's going to happen over the next three or six months, but what's the long-term potential of this, uh, then we'll still invest. But for our companies who um, are kind of running into, you know, they have, let's say, six, six or less months of cash flow and need to raise... It's really difficult right now. And we, we have a few companies out raising their next round, whether it's a, a big seed or a series A, or we've had even some raising later stage rounds. And it's really messy because as Rob says, no one really knows quite how to benchmark these deals. Uh, there's still, I think, you know, a lot of funds are still hesitant to put money to work, especially in larger rounds. You know, the, the, the series A rounds were cre creeping up to kind of $15 million dollars. Uh, to use Ophelia's word conviction, I think it's really hard for, hard for a lot of partnerships to get conviction on writing a big ticket when there's so much uncertainty because people don't know how long this is going to, to go on. There are all the kind of mediocre companies where things aren't really working what yet, but if they could tell a really promising story, then they would be able to fundraise. And so the only thing I can see right now is if you prepare longer on the story and your narrative for how you're going to make it through this environment, and you have a why now, why us pitch, which is compelling, then I think, you know, all, all of these funds here will will write you a ticket. But it's, you know, creating that narrative is, is harder than ever. I also think uh, to Ricardo's point and to that point, that it's really important for founders to address the elephant in the room. Um, you know, not talking about the impact on your business or how it's been for you or what's been happening is worse than addressing the problem head on. Like we've had, uh, you know, founders that have seen revenue declines of up to 100%. But if they can show kind of, uh, you know, how they dealt with it, what, why that happened, what they're doing to think about the next thing, I think that's a much more pragmatic use of time rather than to pretend like it's all, you know, COVID's going to go away and we're all going to be kind of back to normal in like a month or so. So it's not going to matter. Yeah. And so cool. those people, are, 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 a lot of them have raised internal rounds. So I think we've seen in the last two months is good businesses who've been affected a lot have raised internally. And that kind of wave has happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good that's a good transition point to maybe 
asking everyone in the panel what their investing pace has been in the last two, three months. Um, and I know we've been active, but we're also very much in the super early pre-seed side of things. But maybe you guys can comment on what stood out um, and, and what, what are you guys doing in terms of, of uh, investment pace? Happy to take this one. Uh, we've actually signed two term sheets in the last, I want to say, four weeks or so. Um, so one team that we had met for the first time during uh, lockdown. So the whole process was run uh, remotely. And then one team that was known to us before, but we've just been very impressed by uh, execution since we last met, I would say, September, October last year. Um, and now found this a good entry point. I do think there is a strong argument for companies wanting to raise capital earlier right now, because I think there's going to be a bifurcation between those companies who have capital, who can invest in recruitment, sales, marketing, and really pushing. Um, and I think that if companies have demonstrated before this that they were already executing well, then there's a strong argument to give them more money at this point. And maybe to, to add to, to what you said, Ophelia, um, and a question for Rick, Scott, or, or Rob, it's whether or not you guys have shifted some of the ideas that you're investing in, you know, not your traditional thesis, but maybe potentially opportunity thesis or, or anything like that. So I guess, yeah, on our side, I mean, yeah, we've done a couple of deals sort of in lockdown and closed a few more, uh, and obviously a lot of internal fundraisers. So that, that pace continues. Um, one of the deals we've done recently is, is a very early stage deal. Uh, and I think we have probably done slightly more of these early stage investments. We've recently announced Primer with Seacamp. It was also pretty early stage. Um, so, yeah, I think being open to doing a bit more early stage. Um, and it's probably an ongoing trend already. I think this is the interesting first order effects of coronavirus, basically remote working. It's kind of been and gone. And if you're a, if you're a software platform that supports remote working, your valuation is ridiculous. So I'm more interested in what the second order impacts are, like in fintech, for example, what are they going to be the knock on ramifications in fintech? Um, that's what I'm trying to work out in my spare time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from, and, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, just so, I mean, from, from, from a target perspective, we were actually quite fortunate because we uh, closed the, the new early stage fund just beginning of the year. Um, you know, which, which was lucky on a, from a timing perspective, it means we have now firepower uh, throughout this kind of crisis. And we, we were quite active. Uh, literally, we signed um, two term sheets over the last two months, one of which was uh, Thriver, uh, a seed camp company, and of course, benefited a lot now from what's, uh, what's, what's been happening and is in the kind of wider digital health space. Um, and so definitely active, first question. And then second, you know, how, how has the kind of, um parameters changed i think you know definitely there are there's some sectors that have gained an importance i think digital health is one remote working is one uh, on the other you know on this discussion i think it really needs to be seen how fundamentally consumer behavior really changes i mean there's a lot of talk um particularly if you look at travel you know it seems quite quite extreme uh, i don't think that you know people won't travel anymore in in, in the future so uh, i think one is a kind of a short-term view and the other one is kind of what is the long-term fundamental change in consumer behavior and how do you adapt your investment strategy on the back of that? And I think it's probably also a little bit too early uh, to tell. So I think we'll we'll need to see how some of those map out. So Rick, you, you brought up something interesting that I wanted to cover a little later, but we might as well cover it now and then we'll get to the, the valuation stuff. Um, so there's two things. One of them is sectors. Sectors, how they're affected, what we're interested in, what we're not interested in, what we think will change, what won't change. So I'll come back to that second. Um, before I just wanted to finalize the whole metrics point and, um, Patrick Hassani on the, on the chat asks a very good question and maybe Scott, you can take this one, which is how are you advising companies in adapting their sales market product to where the revenue is versus doubling down focus on strongest product market fit that might not have as much revenue or traction right now? Good question. Uh, well, go to market fit uh is is separate to product market fit uh so if the question is more around the go to market as i understand it versus product market then happy to answer that uh if if it is the latter if it's the former sorry if it's all, uh, you know pivoting your product market fit that's going to be really tough uh if you found an early product market fit and are early and 
figuring out how marketing and sales are working to then uh, propagate that and, and, and grow. I think we're seeing, obviously, events are dead. Hopin is, you know, potentially the future of, of, uh, of the events industry. And in our world, in SaaS and enterprise, a huge chunk of uh, each quarter's leads come from the, the, the time and money spent at events. Uh, that's kind of a first order. Then, then following on from that, you use digital marketing. Right now, I think we across our portfolio of about 35 companies, uh, digital spend has been cut right back. And uh, in some cases, people have even started shedding some of their sales teams in preparation for a very long winter. Uh, and so for me and for us at Crane, I think... Uh-oh, lost you, Scott. <laughs> Not the best pose to, to be lost on. Um, <laughs> all right. The, Ophelia, Robert, do you want to comment on what Scott was saying? So hopefully, when he's back, we can get we can get those comments. Yeah, I think to me, I mean, let's see, uh, pivoting products. Yeah, no, you should. Oh, ah. he's back. Did you catch that? We lost like the last minute or a half or so. Uh, <laughs> sorry, do you want me to finish the final? Yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. finalize your thought. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please spend time if, if you're if you're really early stage uh, and you haven't built out your commercial team before you hire anyone else before you spend any more money uh, find a an experienced product marketer or, or an advisor or a consultant who can help with your product marketing because that will pay back dividends as you're trying to figure out which new market to go into uh, it'll help people find you it simplifies your messaging and it actually helps dictate what the go to market strategy should be. Rob, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I just, uh, so I recently invested in a company called Play Play, um, who do video for internal comms. Um, sorry, video for corporate communications. Um, and what I don't want them to do is to change the product roadmap. Right, They have a very clear product roadmap, and they're going to where the long-term opportunity is. Um, so they do not want to change the product approach. What they are changing is the communications approach and the sales marketing approach. Um, so right now, the big use case is on internal communications. How do you support crisis communications, internal communications? Uh, and that's something they can very easily promote. Um, and then as the market changes, they'll go more towards marketing-based messages or recruiting or other use cases. So I think I differentiate between products and go to market on this. Great. Um, Ophelia, I don't, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Otherwise, I wanted to get your thoughts on sectors, uh, hot and not. Um, sectors hot or not. So those haven't really changed too much for us. Um, we actually published our uh, kind of investment criteria and we raised our fund too earlier this year. And we talked about kind of the criteria that we need to see in a team or uh, product to believe that, you know, this is a potential outlier business. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the things we actually said is that a uh, uh, company needs to be recession proof. Um, you know, we'd had 10 years of amazing growth. Um, it was very clear that at some point there was going to be an economic slowdown. Obviously, there's a huge difference between uh, recession proof and Corona proof. Um, but I think that we focused a lot on sectors where we felt that, you know, if enterprise uh, budgets uh, uh, decrease or consumer spend change happens, that we were comfortable with the exposure that we had. So a big uh, focus for us has been around automation of work. Uh, we invested in a company in Dublin called Tynes, uh, which is a security orchestration and automation platform. So enabling security analysts to be much more efficient with their work. Um, we've uh, also done another one not yet announced um, in that space. So it's something that we had a thesis on before, and I guess a lot of these uh, demand for product is being accelerated given what's going on. Um, and then because uh, one of my partners is an engineer and technical by background, we actually spent a lot more time than most, I think, on enterprise, um, you know, thinking about infrastructure, open source software, developer tools, et cetera. Um, and obviously, kind of with the move to everything tech and software in the world, that's been unchanged. So I think a lot of our sectors where we're interested haven't really changed because of Corona. Great. Well, I mean, I'll just add to that, Ophelia. And I think somebody else made the comment that some sectors are overpriced at the moment because they're so obvious, like remote work. And but but I think there's a lot more to be done there. I mean, I think for for Seedcamp, one of the things that we've been focusing on 
is clearly health. And, and I know that we just did this uh, investment together, Rick, on Thriva. Health is so top of mind now that and it's so we're not even in the depths of the iceberg yet. Like we haven't even got to the point where the, the, the global population is used to pro, a proactive health system whereby we proactively try to prevent things from happening rather than everything being reactive. So that's an area that's very much of interest for us. Um, clearly things like uh, remote work or anything like that, you, you kind of almost have to break it down, which parts are still exciting, which parts are already over invested. You know, I think we haven't seen the end of our comms tools. Like, I think there's still a lot more work to be done there. Slack has done some great stuff, but I think there's a lot more to do there. And, and we've made some new investments there. And then I think that there's stuff that's always kind of lingering in the background. And this is where I wanted to pick on you next, Rob, which is, you know, fintech has been one of these areas that has long been a source of innovation for Europe. It's continuing to deliver. And in COVID times, I'm just wondering, you know, what are the things that you're seeing sort of really flourish because of what's going on? And I, you know, I, I kind of, you can include insurance if you want within that, just because I know a lot of people are burned by insurance or you can exclude it, I'll leave it up to you. It's a, it's a tricky one, actually. So uh, the short-term impact of fintech is probably bad for a few people. Transaction volumes overall are down quite a lot. People are just buying less. Uh, so anyone who uses transactional volumes has been heard a bit. Um, anyone doing lending, and let's see how that pans out. But it's probably, it's gonna be, we're gonna find out who was really lending smartly uh, over the next few months, finally. Having had 10 years of everyone who lending, uh, lends doing very well, despite having weak underwriting. Um, but I think overall it's going to be quite tough. Um, uh, and then anyone who's in the wealth management space um, has been tough. I guess the exception has been the Robin Hood type trading platforms. So anyone allowing sort of day trading or sort of speculation, that market has done extremely well with shares bouncing around at random uh, over the last few months. So yeah, anyone who facilitates day trading has done pretty well. Um, I think looking forward, yeah, I look at insurance, for example, and the way that some insurers have behaved uh, and the way they tried to avoid paying out claims, uh, they tried to use a pandemic as an excuse not to pay, further decreases trust in the industry. Um, and it will also lead to them retreating from the market, increasing prices, a sort of hardening market uh, in insurance, and that will definitely create opportunities for startups. Uh, I think similarly in lending, I think opportunities will emerge over the coming months because existing players will pull, up, pull back from the lending market. Uh, and then I think there's overall a very positive trend for anyone who is a mobile first uh, wealth manager or a mobile first bank. Um, people don't want to go to physical branches anymore uh, or speak to financial advisors in person. Uh, so there's a long term uh, accelerant uh, for yeah, the neo banks. Um, maybe just a quick comment on the on the remote work, because I know we, we mentioned that, you know, a cu couple of times now on, on the on the sector, hot or not discussion and um i mean i think there's obviously a lot of collaboration tools that are now doing extremely well i mean zoom is worth more than all u.s airlines together uh but you know on a on a kind of semi funny note everyone that you know has children at home can't wait to go back to the office so uh you know i think that there's obviously at the current time we're sitting at home particularly here in the uk you know those those tools are you know really really important but i think uh you know long-term people will go back to the office and they need you know need to see their co-workers and and and, and so I, that's my my feel i mean I, I think we'll need to see how this how this maps out uh, i don't see what we all will forever work remotely right so mm -hmm. just counterbalance that a little bit all right guys well we've covered quite a bit we've covered metrics we've, we've covered what you need to be focusing on where where to cut some of the costs we'll revisit the cost cutting bit in a second but and we covered sectors so now we're going to go into the meat of the session which is around valuations i know a lot of people are asking questions uh about valuations and how those are affected uh we're gonna be talking about round sizes how those are affected terms and how to get in touch with with vc so let's start off um scott i'm going to start off with you but before before i ask you the first question i just wanted to set some groundwork for for founders that are not, not familiar with some of the stages obviously pre-seed seed series a series b series c those are obviously uh, sequential, um, the sizes of those vary year on year. Um, maybe Scott, you can comment on kind of what they were a while ago, maybe what you're seeing today, but they are correlated with um, the valuation of the company. There's a ratio there that's like the money raised divided by post money equals dilution. And there is a tight range. And you know, one of the things that 
that you can easily look up and in blog posts everywhere is how those things are correlated. So it's expected that if round sizes are going up or down, there's going to be a proportionate related decrease or increase in valuation. So maybe with that, Scott, you can you can share with us kind of what your thoughts are on round sizes um, and have you seen them before and now? I mean, for us, pre, pre-COVID, we were always wanting a minimum at the seed stage of at least 18 months uh, and ideally two years uh, to get the kind of metrics, story, team together to where, you know, we could package it up and take it basically uh, to any one of the three funds. I don't know if it's the same on your screen, but uh, Alder can blossom target global. And uh, hopefully ideally at that stage have enough meat on the bone, but a, a real strong sense of product market fit that it's, it's, you know, slightly easier for them to make a decision. Uh, I think now what we're focusing on more than we did before is that there's enough runway for at least two years. And uh, we've always, you know, we're quite collaborative. So we actually build syndicates, even pre COVID, we were building strong syndicates uh, for the case when we're in these kinds of environments. And now it's more important than ever. I look at the companies where we did that and it's been very easy to get an internal round pulled together quickly. Uh, with companies where we're the only VC uh, and things are going well, then great, <laughs> we can do that. In other cases where we have investments and it's you know 50 angels, none of the angels are digging into their pockets and helping to extend the runway with with internal rounds. And so I think what we're seeing now is um, what we're what we're at least looking at is round sizes going up slightly. Uh, the burn and the ramp up plan is maybe a little less aggressive than it used to be. I think. For now, at least for the next six months, hiring is kind of on an as-needed basis. Uh, and then, um, I guess the the thing we're coaching our founders on right now at the seed stage is make sure you're spending time thinking about what the narrative is. Like, what's the 2020 investment plan? Where are we investing? What are we building? And therefore, what's the story if you need to go out in the first half of 2021? What is your 2020 story of how you navigated? The COVID, uh, the COVID crisis. So, uh, those are, I think, the two points I would highlight. So, uh, maybe if, if either one of you, Ophelia or Rob, want to comment on on round sizes, one of the things that drove round sizes, especially last year, was a lot of push by by both founders and investors to blitz scale or to dominate a sector, and you know that that also led to high burn. And I think we've covered it in previous questions and points that obviously there's a, a, a increased consciousness about the use of cash, but maybe you can comment on how you're seeing some of those old older philosophies around decimating a market uh, being affected right now uh, and in, in a cash conservation environment. Um, yeah, I, I guess, I know, I think we had this before coronavirus, right? I think the struggles of SoftBank and the struggles of Rocket Internet, I think, Blitz scaling has fallen out of fashion quite a while ago. Um, so yeah, and I think that's coronavirus helps accelerate that, but it wasn't a sort of strategy we thought was an interesting strategy in any case. Um, I think there are some sectors where there is a sense that there is a sort of a, a bit of a race that being first to market really matters. Um, so we see that in mobility, for example, um, but that's definitely, I think, been sort of scaling back over the last year. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. sorry, I, I guess maybe the inverse of that question is, what is a weak round? I think one of the questions some some founders have been asking in the chat is around getting getting raising any kind of money and then maybe even getting the future fund involved and then wondering or fearing that that's going to be a negative signal. And I don't know if Rick or Phil, you have a view on that, but basically it's like if if massive rounds are maybe something that's not so common for the you know what Rob mentioned, the smaller rounds, which are in some cases the rescue rounds, um, what are what are your thoughts on those, and also the signaling impact long term of that? I mean, I, I, happy to go first, unless Ophelia, you want to go? No, go for it. Yeah, I think I mean we've we've definitely seen probably more extension rounds right now, uh, either from insiders or also kind of potentially an, an, an external fund coming in and. Uh, extending the runway to then, you know, obviously benefiting from maybe potentially higher valuations in six months time or in a year's time. So 
I think to do a, you know, a top up or, or, you know, a quick round in this current time is not necessarily seen as something negative opposite. I think, you know, most later stage investors will, uh, you know, will totally understand and, and, and kind of, I think see this as a favorable, you know, as, as, as a good thing. Um, and, and in combination, obviously with reducing burn and, uh, extending runway generally, I think, you know, and, and, and a more focus on cost efficiency, uh, I, I think is, you know, the new reality. So I don't know if that answers part of your, your question. Or yeah. And I, and I, and I agree with that. And I think it is part of the new reality. I mean, my, my personal opinion is people shouldn't be fearful of that. It's like, you, you just, you take what you can at the moment. And in some cases it will be internal, like some cases will be external. And I think every investor out there will, will, Calibrate accordingly, you know, in the context. But I think one of the, the topics to me, that I mean, the future fund very much fits into that. A couple of questions about future fund. A couple of our companies yeah. have applied, and that is, is very much a part of a strategy of a bridge round. It has to be supported by existing investors. It's structured as a convertible note, so it's, it's structured to work well for bridge funding uh, for companies. And I think that won't be seen negatively at all. So, as part of this. I we started this conversation with the, the two bookends on the one bookend was like the massive rounds of yesteryear for the purposes of like blitz scaling and war testing. Then now we just covered bridge bridge rounds and, and what the signaling of that is. And then there is this intermediate, which is the competitive dynamic rounds that we touched upon a little earlier when Rick was talking about some of the things that are we're seeing right now, which is VCs in some cases competing with very few deals and they're therefore driving up the round sizes. I don't know if Ophelia, if, is that something you've been seeing or if you, if you want to comment on? It's like um, to, to have founders, uh, you know, think through how to either manage that or what, what is that you're seeing? As in are still competitive rounds still happening? Yeah. Are they happening? How are they happening? How do they change the dynamic in times like these? Um, so I think competitive rounds are still happening. Um, I think that founders who either have supportive VCs already on their cap table or are familiar with the fundraising process are still managing to orchestrate pretty good competitive fundraising processes. Um, I don't think it matters that you need to be able to meet the fund in person. I think you can do that all remotely. Um, and by nature, when there's a competitive round, valuations go up. So I think just like, as you said, kind of in the public markets as a flight to quality, if, if you have a really good company um, and you can orchestrate a good fundraise, then, you know, valuation, if you get into a competitive situation, will go up. So on that note, and this is the, again, one of the, the tricky questions to answer, one of your companies, pick any, just picture one of your portfolio companies, you know, has to go out and fundraise. And, you know, you you're they're wondering whether they should, have a haircut on their valuation, whether they should signal like a stronger one. And, and there's all sorts of anxiety around, okay, I do need to go fundraise. I can either try to create a, a competitive dynamic somehow, or I can go into a bridge scenario and, and, and look for that. How are you advising your founders with embarking on that? Um, not only in the round size, but also like how to, how to price it, how to create that dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the one thing that I would definitely advise founders against, because we've seen this twice now during COVID where it's actually fallen apart, is trying to create a competitive round where there isn't any substance to that. Mm -hmm. um, because if investors realize that you're trying to do that, you might have all parties walk away and end up with nothing. Um, I think you can only really use a competitive round if there is genuine interest. Um, from external investors wanting to invest in your company. I think the way that it normally works best, and this is what we've seen, um, is that you first talk to your existing investors to understand to what extent they want to support you, how much capital there is from an internal round, kind of get a sense of where that would price. And then when you're having conversations with external or new investors, it's a very strong position to say, all of my insiders want to do either you know pro art or super pro art or want to put in x and they've priced it here so then you have a floor to where the next round has to be um and i think always have that conversation first or you might flip it the other way and maybe there's an external party that you've been talking to for either a short amount of time or long amount of time or whatever they're at the table and they've got a sense of what they want to do then you can use that to catalyze discussions 
but don't try and create something when there's nothing. Um, because I think investors will uh, come wise to that very quickly. You know, some of the questions around that, Ophelia, are also around how to structure these raises. You know, some people are trying to achieve what you said through a convertible saying uncapped or like a high premium with like a high discount. What are you seeing? What are you guys seeing in terms of how deals are being structured right now in order to achieve what you just said, Ophelia? So I think the obvious routes are either convertible or price round. Um, I think you know we can probably spend another hour debating the pluses and minuses of the convertible. In some ways, it's good because it's quick. Um, if you don't have a cap and use it as a discount to the next round, then you're not forcing a price on the company or now or in the next 12 months. The flip side is, and we see this quite often, is that founders don't realize the additional dilution that they're taking now for when that future round happens later. Um, so I think that price rounds kind of remove some of uh, some of those negatives. So, uh, but the challenge with the price round is that you can enter into a long legal uh, yeah. kind of uh, documents, negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, which really take the founder's eyes off the business at the point of which it needs it the most. Um, but I would have a honest and transparent discussion with whoever's giving you the capital as to what are the pluses and minuses of each structure and try and figure out with them what's the best way forward and why. Yeah. Uh, uh, real quickly on that, I don't know how I don't have gray hair from the number of convertibles we've done over the last like three months. But what we always do when we send uh, the term sheet is we send a cap table with a simulation of uh, here's the convertible. So it's a box below the round that we invested in previously. And then here's a simulation of your let's say you get to a Series A, which is why we're investing now. And then let's just assume here's the pre money and the amount coming in from one or two new investors with existing investors doing pro rata or whatever. And then the, the founders can go away and plug plug away and look at it so they can see the amount of capital they're taking now at the cap, the impact that that dilution then has in conjunction with the next round. And so it's, as, as Ophelia says, as long as you're dealing with someone who's transparent and can send you that data, it's, uh, in our opinion, right now, it's just the fastest way to raise capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, unless I think you're a VCT or an EIS, I, I don't know, but for normal funds, it's just the fastest way to get capital into the business and then get back to, to operating. Hmm. Rob, have you seen any emergence of, uh, as as you put it, the oldest fund in the room? Um, some of the terms that existed in 2008 uh, are rearing their ugly heads right now. Are you seeing anything that founders should be steer, steer clear of or, or be mindful of that might be popping up in term sheets right now as a, as a indicative of the times we're in? You're on mute, Rob. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, there's plenty of writing out there on what to avoid in your term sheet. I don't think that's changed dramatically. There's always an occasional rogue out there who's asking for something outrageous, um, but it's a pretty standard set of terms. Um, I guess what we had felt over the last couple of years is the kind of classic Silicon Valley VC term sheet that we've been using for 20 years. Um, there were people who were trying to do lighter versions of that and take out some of the sort of standard terms uh, and sort of selling to founders on that basis that we have no protection and we give all our shares to you and actually we just give up all our rights and here's our money. Uh, and I think coronavirus is a sort of a well-timed sort of move back from that, that there does have to be some terms around this. There does have to be a legal document. We do need some protections as investors uh, and we can't just um, hand over the money and walk away. Uh, and so, yeah, I think we've seen in the last couple of months uh, some elements of reversion to what was the sort of standard term sheet 10 years ago. Yeah, and it's probably more around governance, really, more so than like trying to be commercially taking advantage of the situation. It's like, actually, we want to help you deal with some of the tricky circumstances, which might include exactly. having to wind down the company. You want to have some proper governance on how to do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Moving not, on. Sorry, we're, go, Scott. We're, we're not seeing anything unusual in, uh, in our, well, the deals we're doing or even in the, the series A or B rounds. What I'm more worried about is that the angel community or the the, the, the really, you know, the pre-seed funds, uh, not even the funds, it's kind of more angel community, especially in, on the continent, less in the UK, really screwing founders on valuations right now in this period. 
and putting in weird terms that we haven't seen. So I'm I'm just expecting starting in 2021 to start seeing some wonky cap tables like we used to 10 years ago. We're not seeing it right now, and we're not seeing kind of bad players in the ecosystem, but I'm sure they will rear their ugly heads. Yeah. This is why, and if you don't mind me doing a 60 second plug, we set up uh, this vehicle with um, 30 angels uh, who are former operators or even current operators from unicorns called Cultivate uh, to invest 250K at the pre-seed and seed stage to make sure that during these times, founders can get access to really high quality experienced people um, who know kind of what terms should look like at this stage. And so it's not about uh, being kind of dragged to find uh, capital when they have all the power and that's where you get these wonky terms come in. So anyone thinking about starting a company now should apply. Love it, Ophelia, love it. Um, on the communications, I know that you brought this up earlier, uh, Ophelia, So, but I'll, I'll open it up to everyone. I think, so we've covered valuations. I think it's clear that they're affected by what's going on. It, I've had a couple of chats with other friends. Nobody can put a number on it. It's not like there's a 20% or a 30% reduction in valuations. We just know that they are being affected. We know that companies are raising more bridges than ever before. We know that some of the bigger rounds that are happening are mostly because of competitive dynamics. We also know that the, the terms are now being rectified towards increased governance. But I think the last point that I wanted to cover was the fundraising process itself. And of course, now it involves mostly Zoom calls, right? And that's one area that I wanted to talk about. But another question that came up earlier before the event was how to build relationship with VCs, because one of the pieces of advice that we give founders is, you know, build a relationship, spend time, you know, reach out. And it, you know, the question was, you know, founders are often told to build relationships early, but beyond initial meeting to introduce the company, how do you do this effectively post COVID? There are only, but so many ways you can visit a VC just to update them on the company or ask a possibly contrived question doubly hard during lockdown. So maybe it's, a combination of that question plus how to use Zoom effectively during the chances you do get to pitch the company. Who wants to take that one? So I think the good news for founders is that VCs have never had more time on their hands because we're not on planes anywhere. So I think the general, what mm -hmm. I'm hearing from founders is actually getting meetings or kind of coffee, virtual coffee chats has been easier than ever. Um, actually so i think that you know asking for a quick catch-up is almost uh it's more acceptable like it's and definitely easier to do so i wouldn't be put off by the fact you can't do it in person i think um founders pitching like the official pitch on zoom is much harder and i would really encourage founders to to practice if it's a really important pitch um especially if there's more than one founder on the zoom I think that unfortunately people uh, don't get enough time to think about the dynamic, like who's going to say what, um, you know, it's uh, get, making sure that you have that really good rapport that you do with each other in the room that you have it virtually. And I think that a lot of founders unfortunately are kind of uh, falling prey to the fact that they haven't had the time on Zoom with each other's to think about that. Um, so that would be my one piece of advice. I Great. completely agree with that. I think one-to-one uh, -one conversations on Zoom can work really well. But yeah, one-to-many is a disaster. It was pretty bad in, in person, but it's even worse on Zoom. Um, and yeah, I think the fact that the standard now to me is becoming half-hour Zooms, which means I can do double the number of conversations when I was having one-hour meetings with someone who'd traveled to London or I traveled to Berlin. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be much more efficient in that way. We're mm -hmm. yeah, often here a whole hour then, Rob, huh? on this uh, virtual I know, panel. yeah, well, sorry. Yeah, I'll be multitasking the last <laughs> half hour, it's fine. I mean, just, just, just one- Taking a meeting, huh, Rob? Well, <laughs> well, one general comment. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, it makes it makes a huge difference, you know, if you do your homework on a specific uh, VC and understand, you know, how well, uh, you know, how, how much experience they bring in a specific sector and, 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 and it will be a lot easier to convince someone who's, you know, who's an expert in, I don't know, in Rob's case, you know, FinTech, to talk virtually about a, a product than, um, you know, compared to other sectors where you talk to VC where he has to just do the whole work from scratch, right? So uh, I guess the point is, you know, if you do your homework on specific funds and, and, and specific investors, that will definitely help, uh, you know, the, the funds do a kind of more efficient investment process. Great, I, I want to do a round robin of advice from each one of you on cash management. 
so basically maybe we'll start with Brick, um, then Ophelia, then Scott, then, then Rob. Just go through um, kind of ideas that you have to help founders uh, not only restate kind of how they're gonna burn cash at the moment and conserve cash, if you will, but also be able to, to have a story to tell at the end of this that still shows strength and growth and traction. Rick. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a pretty unique point in time where you're not gonna get penalized for uh, slower revenue growth uh, and therefore, you know, to save on marketing costs and actually spend more on kind of developing the product, um, you know, might be a good idea at this point in time. Uh, at the same time, I mean, generally advises to obviously reduce the burn and, and, and save, you know, save money. But, you know, having said that, you know, if you do see a great hire uh, that, you know, comes, you know, because there's obviously more people being made redundant, you might come across someone that you really want to hire. So definitely, you know, don't shy away from those kind of decisions. Um, but yeah, generally, I think probably reducing marketing costs and working on the product. I think that's that's the one general thought I have on in terms of this question. Great. Billy, did you want to? Yeah, I think um, mainly the discussions have been around hiring um, and how to think about necessary and crucial hires. Um, and it, unfortunately, it's a really delicate balance without knowing the outlook. Um, I think most of our companies have kind of done a worst case scenario and forecast, uh, you know, looking uh, everything looking bad until the end of 2020. And I think that you have to be prepared to kind of reaccelerate if things are looking more positive. Um, but given that none of us, you know, know what life is going to look like in a month or two months from now, uh, it's just really hard to say. I, I think to Ricardo's point, being cautious is better than being too aggressive. I think, um, I mean, in our little world of enterprise software, uh, the, the biggest effect has been the length of the sales cycles. So uh, of our 35 companies, we've, we've had three that have been, I would say, negatively impacted, like in a, in a severe way where there's been churn or kind of zero new sales. Across the board, most of them are still uh, closing deals. They're just taking slightly longer. And deal sizes are still kind of in the same region of where they were before. In some cases, several of them are still growing contract sizes because big companies still need to move to the cloud, automate systems, make people more efficient, secure their work workforce who's now working from home. And so in our little world, uh, where there's a clear plan and, and growth is, let's just say, steady enough, we've been telling them to be a bit more aggressive because for our companies, there's a lot of talent on the market that is unemployed. And there are other people at companies where uh, big public companies, I'm sure you all are getting various lists of you know entire teams that have been let go. So you know, uh, VCs have basically turned into recruiters over the last few months. That's like probably 50% of my job is like, just sitting and doing like VPC level uh, recruiting. And so for some of ours, we're, you know, it's, it's, um, we're still being cautious, but we're, we're being a little bit more aggressive than usual because we're able to go out and get incredibly good talent for some of these companies now where it, it would have been, you know, post series A where we could get someone as good as, as they could. So for us, we always say have three scenarios, have your worst case, have your base case, have the best case and the best case, you have you have uh, you know exactly what you would invest into if something opportunistic came along. In the worst case, you know what you would cut first uh, if you need to. So that, those are kind of our operating principles. Rob, yeah, I think our existing portfolio we're looking for them to have at least eighteen months of runway, and any new investments you want to make have at least twenty four months of runway. Um, and yeah, I think you can dump a lot of ills in Q2 and no one's going to care about Q2 performance in 2020. Um, what's really important is that come early 2021, the numbers are looking good and you have good good growth. Uh, and that's what we're really focused on is, you know, how's this going to look in a year's time? Yeah. Well, guys, first of all, I just wanted to thank you again for your time. I know we've covered a lot of subjects and I'm sure we could go into huge deep dives as, as each one of you have mentioned, even stuff like the legal structures could be another hour of this and maybe we can do it. Maybe another time we set one of these up for another month from now. But thanks again for, for this. Um, 
I just wanted to give each of you an opportunity um, as we sign off to to do a little bit of sh selfless shame selfless uh, shameless promotion of yourselves. Um, Ophelia already kicked that off a little bit, um, but what we can do is how you guys uh, like to be contacted um, and also a little bit about uh, what you're looking for in founders. So I'll, I'll just kick off. Um, as I mentioned, Seed Camp is pretty much focused on pre-seed and seed. We love to support founders through that journey to raise the best Series A uh, they can. And with a lot of the guys here in this room uh, being part of, of that journey. And, you know, a lot of the things that we, we try to back are people who are driving for global uh, businesses with outsized outcomes. So if you're interested in that or any of the sectors that we spoke about, I'd love to hear from you. I'm available on, on uh, carlos at seedcamp.com. And obviously our website, there's a, there's a tab there looking for funding. Rick. Yeah, sure. So we, you know, we're looking for big category leaders and, and founders that are trying to, you know, change the world and build, you know, billion dollar businesses and uh, try to reach out please in on, on all media uh, as possible. And we'll try to respond. So from LinkedIn to Twitter, uh, also kind of, via via email or our website and you know we'll try to be as responsive as possible we have one advantage that we kind of truly european in the sense of an office in berlin we have an office in in london office in barcelona and tel aviv so um yeah looking or calling out for all european founders cool okay any, any additional words about, about blossom if anyone's building something interesting with big plans during these times we'd love to hear from you Cool, Scott and Rob. I'd say, um, look, we invest Series A, but we like to meet companies really early. Um, so please reach out. I prefer email, one page, plain text email of why it's interesting and why we should do a call uh, and have that conversation early. That's how I end up investing in Carwow uh, and a bunch of other companies. So yeah, just, just reach out by email. Scott? Email or... All of us on the panel love a warm introduction. So from someone that we work with uh, or have worked with or have funded, um, and we only focus, we're very thematic. So we only focus on companies building products for the enterprise. So if you're doing that, love to have a chat, uh, get in touch with me through Ophelia or Rob or any of these people, it'd be great. <laughs> great, and, and I guess the last is just a big thank you to the Hopin team who's helped put this together as well as uh, Miguel from our team. Uh, thanks again for, for building the awesome tech that enables this to happen. Guys, uh, I'm promoting Hopin. If you have an event that you're going to be hosting, it is the best platform to be using. All right. With that, guys. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, thanks Carlos. Thanks, Rick. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Bye.